On the Gary Bisbee Show, hear practical lessons from today's healthcare insiders. We'll uncover stories about their challenges, paths to success, and the skills that they've developed. As together, we'll explore how the healthcare economy is transforming. Brad Stone is an accomplished author and reporter on global technology companies. His new book, Amazon Unbound, is a tour de force on the transformation of Amazon and its founder and leader, Jeff Bezos. We covered substantial ground in this conversation. First, for our healthcare audience, Brad spoke about the grand challenge, the term for Amazon's pursuit of healthcare, and what Brad describes is an area of major expansion. Regarding lessons for leaders, Brad discussed the fact that Bezos was inspirational, but could also instill fear. He was willing to disrupt the company in pursuit of a new idea or invention, such as Alexa. Those of us in healthcare are struggling with becoming more consumer-centric. Brad built the case for Bezos being solely committed to the consumer and being willing to pursue new ideas and disrupt the company to provide better services for the consumer. When I asked Brad the question, was Bezos of more value to Amazon as an operator or an inventor, he provided a creative rationale that all leaders should think about. Brad debated how Bezos compared to other big tech founder CEOs, such as Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Brad began to write Amazon Unbound three years ago, and he thought he was writing about the transformation of a company. It turned out he was writing about the transformation of a person. Let's join the conversation with Brad Stone. Well, good morning, Brad, and welcome. Hi, Gary. Thanks for having me. We're pleased to have you at this microphone. We'd love to chat with you about Amazon Unbound, which is uh, published just a couple of days ago. So congratulations. What an effort. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, no, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a long journey. I actually worked on it for three years, and then I wrote the book from this room, which is actually a garage during the pandemic. Wow. Well, all 450 pages of it, I, I did want to ask, when do you write? Do you have any particular time uh, of day or night? Or? I, I found, yeah, my, my sort of brain is, is the most uh, fertile in, in the morning. And so I would go, I would get, get down here in this cavern at around 7 or 7.30, do a couple hours, and then, and then do more reporting or outlining in the afternoon. As an executive, global executive editor uh, for technology at Bloomberg News, I was wondering, what's the day job, writing the book or the executive editor That's job? That's another reason why I, I, the early morning hours were key, because the day is distractions galore and a lot of meetings. You know, in a weird way, the pandemic maybe made it a little easier. I wasn't, you know, trying to sneak off for bits of time here and there. Uh, but yeah, Bloomberg, we cover... You know, the, the big tech companies, the entrepreneurs, the startups all around the world, including in Asia, which makes the night times kind of busy. Um, so I don't know. You know, I guess I, I was lucky that uh, in a perverse way that I didn't have the fear of missing out uh, during the pandemic. I was sort of able to, to focus. Well, I know you're an English major from Columbia. Were you always interested in writing? You know, I think I got the bug in college, uh, going to creative writing workshops. I also worked at the Columbia radio station, WKCR, covering the news. And I just got the news bug. Went to the once proud magazine known as Newsweek uh, for many years and came out to Silicon Valley. A stop at the New York Times, uh, covering Amazon and other big tech companies. And then Bloomberg, which has just been a sort of fantastic home for in-depth uh, journalism. Well, let's look at Amazon Unbound. I guess really want to start back in 2013 when you published uh, the Everything Store. Why did you choose to write about Amazon and Bezos at that point versus any other big tech company and founder? You know, it was actually just opportunistic, Gary. I, I was, I was, I wanted to write a book, and it seemed to me that you know there had been Apple books and and Microsoft books and Google books, and um, it was an avenue. It was a it was a street that wasn't you know jammed with traffic in a way. And I think that was because at the time Amazon was so secretive and Bezos had been sort of personally unavailable to the press for, for a number of years since the dot-com bust. And, um, and then you know, I thought, okay, well, I covered this company for the New York Times and now it's disrupting book publishing and it seems much more interesting. You know, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll dive into that. And little did I know, and really had no special foresight at all, how interesting it was and how, how uh, important it would be in our society, in our, in our economy. 
And so that was the Everything Store. It was published in 2013. And then I thought, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that book, but I'll move on to other things. And it just kept changing. And the Kindle company became the Alexa company. And the marketplace became global. And Amazon went into India. And Amazon went into Hollywood. And Bezos bought the Washington Post. And he became a subject of tabloid fascination. And I thought, okay, this is now even more interesting. I need to write another volume. And now, you know, and, and of course, even while I was writing, a lot happened, including HQ2, the big, you know, the big controversial search for a second headquarters. For sure. And AOC and, uh, and her compatriots got involved in that one, right? Our audience here are interested in leadership and thinking back to the Everything Store, um, what, did you, what did you take away about Bezos as a leader at that point? Because I imagine that's evolved too through time. But what, what would you say were the key characteristics of Bezos as a leader at that point? Let's start out by positing that he is obviously a tremendous leader, right? The the value creation, um, the disruption of not just retail, but enterprise computing, you know, book publishing, um, voice computing, you know, it's a tremendous record of accomplishment. And maybe we could put it alongside Steve Jobs and in, in, in just maybe Bill Gates and the sheer kind of impact. And I do believe he will be remembered as a tremendous leader. Um, I think that he has been remarkable in creating a system of invention that might perhaps endure while he, when he's gone. And these are all of the, the rituals inside Amazon, the six page documents, which I write a lot about in the book. Right. Um, the, you know, the, the, the biannual meetings, the leadership principles uh, that are followed with almost religious fervor inside the company, like frugality and think big disagree and commit. Some of those were taken from kind of Silicon Valley best practices, you know, Intel, for example, or Walmart, um, and others he kind of came up with and refined. Um, so in that respect, also a kind of remarkable leader, really thinking about how, you know, he can build a company that lasts longer than, than he is around. But Gary, the last sort of element, I think, of the of the answer is he's he's like, he's pretty brutal, right? In a way that maybe is not an exemplar, um, but seems somewhat common in Silicon Valley. So I have stories in Amazon Unbound of him ripping up documents and throwing them down the table because there's a mathematical error or cutting an employee off at the knees. I do feel like in Amazon Unbound, I'm telling the story of him maturing as a leader, but that is something that both intimidated and maybe inspires some of his employees. It's been effective, and yet in the, in the wrong hands, copied by the wrong kind of leader, it probably can be counterproductive. As you read the book, certainly one of my takeaways was he is really a unique person, at least in my world. Uh, I look at him. How does he stack up? You mentioned Jobs and Gates and others. How does he stack up with the other big tech founder CEOs in terms of just being a unique person? Well, he, he's a singular figure. I think that in some respects, like if we're going to compare him, um, maybe Steve Jobs had, you know, more of a refined design sense, um, more more of a completionist when it came to Apple products. Um, Bezos is more technical, I think, than Jobs was. What, what's remarkable to me is his ability to dive deep in various disciplines. And so I tell the story in Amazon Unbound of Alexa, which is an idea that Jeff has, and he emails his executives about. And then I had the first drawing of Alexa on an Amazon whiteboard that he, in his own hand, um, and he also sort of goes deep into these documents to understand the frontier of artificial intelligence, speech recognition, and then with the grocery store technologies, uh, computer vision. That's, I think it's, it's unique. And in that respect, maybe we could compare him to Bill Gates, maybe to some extent to Mark Zuckerberg. Um, but, and then you look at the Washington Post, which he has revived, really. We have to give him credit for that. And, and getting into the details of a media business, not the editorial details, but certainly uh, the, the business plan and the operating details. And so, yeah, I think he's, he's unique and we'll look back and his uh, visage will be chiseled into the Mount Rushmore of business leaders, I think, who have left a, a, a historic impact. I think I've heard you say that in terms of his legacy, you figured that he would want to be known as an innovator. Is that true? He, he has said that. In his last in investor letter, he says, um, you know, I, I consider myself an inventor. And my joke has been, 
you know, like Taylor Swift wants to be a songwriter, but the world sort of sees her as a performer, um, you know, and a singer. And Bezos, I think, will wants to be seen as an inventor. Um, and yet I think we'll consider him to be an empire builder, you know, an operator, maybe a monopolist, perhaps a philanthropist, depending on the kind of legacy he leaves there. Thinking about the success of Amazon, you know, you can be an innovator or you could be a leader, operator, using that term, or both. Uh, I guess in his case, he'd be both. Which do you think ultimately is the most important contributor to Amazon's success, being an innovator or being an operator? I'm going to go, and it's a really good question, so maybe tonight you know, or, or later today in, in the shower on the exercise bike, I'll change my mind. Um, I'm going to say operator because... You know, I go back to 1995 when he opened an online bookstore, and it wasn't the first online bookstore. And he expanded into new product categories, and it wasn't the first online retailer. Um, and the difference was Bezos as an operator, his ability to focus on on you know the customer, to um, seduce Wall Street, and to create a different kind of relationship with investors where they were willing to kind of hold their nose in the in the lean years and in the profitless years. And the invention's been important, you know, but like the Kindle wasn't the first e-reader. It had elements that the other e-readers didn't. Alexa was unique. AWS is maybe the outlier because I think that really was revolutionary. Um, but again, you know, Oracle and, 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 and other companies had sort of elements of, of enterprise computing in the, in the cloud. So Bezos, he kind of he crystallizes some things that are out there and brings them together. And in that respect, he's a tremendous in innovator. But it's the operator and the strategy the, the strategic mastermind that you know evaluates a, a competitive landscape and navigates around it and bends it all to his will that i think is probably most most responsible for the success you make the point in the book that he's an avid reader and would work and would talk about books with his staff uh how important do you think that was to his success the fact that he was so well read in the early years tremendous and and it's why in the everything store the first book i have an appendix of the uh, the s team reading list and you can look at books like good to great or the innovator's dilemma or um there was a book called um i'm going to forget its name uh it was by steve grand the video game designer that inspired the creation of AWS. And you really see it in the first book, I kind of try to draw connections between the books they were reading at the time and the big steps or the organizational changes um, that really led to Amazon's, particularly the revival in the, in the first decade of the 2000s. And then in, in Amazon Unbound, I was looking for that again. And I had this idea, Gary, of doing another appendix, another Jeff's reading list. And I didn't find much. And I, I feel like maybe a little bit of the reading culture has lapsed there. The one, the one um, exception is they all read a book by Mark Levinson called The Great A and P, and and it was David Zapolsky, the chief lawyer at Amazon, that urged the the leadership team to read it, not not Jeff. And he thought that you know the the, the antitrust struggles of of the A and P supermarket in like the 2030s and uh, sorry, the 1930s and 40s would be instructive because Amazon itself is moving into a phase of heightened regulatory scrutiny. So reading has been important. And I think you look at things like Alexa and, and a lot of Jeff's commitment to voice uh, computing is because he's a Star Trek fan and a science fiction fan. So it has been uh, really important over the arc of history. Of course, uh, he's uh, appointed Andy Jassy now as the um, new CEO. He's moved to executive chairman. And getting back to the question about innovator versus operator, um, you kind of wonder whether a new CEO is going to have that blend of operator and innovator in such a way that they can move uh, Amazon forward at the pace that uh, that Jeff did. It's the key question. And, and Jassy, I do not get the sense, is an innovator. Um, certainly, AWS has been innovative. Um, and so he does, you know, he has got technical people around him. Um, but the other, the thing that may, the reason why maybe it doesn't matter as much is because Bezos says he's going to remain in that invention role and he'll be executive chairman. And, you know, it's not just the new ideas that are important, Gary. I mean, I think what, what I sort of learned researching Amazon Unbound is it's the, it's the sort of magic of the, of the founder and the, and not just the inspiration, but like the fear, the fear that he can inspire. 
And so when Bezos has a new idea, it might be an, an, a really interesting new technical feat, but it might be something silly. Like I tell the story of this thing called the uh, single cow burger in Amazon Unbound. And Bezos propels that through the organization. He kind of breaks through the bureaucratic slush to make it happen. And that's the real magic. Not just inventing new things, but sort of sponsoring them and making sure that you know the, the company invests what they need to invest and doesn't pull back. Uh, and, and also then kind of releases it in a, a very high profile. The, one more example I'll just quickly bring up was Siri with Apple, and Jobs did sponsor it. He acquired the company. He introduced it in the iPhone 4S, I think, and then he passed away, unfortunately, the next day. And you kind of feel, if you're an Apple user, that Siri is a little bit of an orphan inside a big company, whereas Alexa still has the maniacal attention of the founder, and that might be the difference. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting because you could see that Jeff might come up with some creative idea, but uh, at n not being the CEO, it might be a little bit more difficult for him to drive that through the organization. It'll be interesting to follow. That might be your next book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I think if he wants to, he'll still be able to drive it. The question is, will he be floating off in his yacht? Will he be flying to space? Will he be in Washington, D.C. or in Hollywood? It's more, I think, the distraction uh, more than like he'll still always pull a lot of water at at Amazon, but how how closely will he stick around is the question. Well, and you make the point uh, quoted Jamie Dimon in the book that uh, he's more or less a, become a man of the world uh, versus the earlier days. How do you see all of this uh, kind of pursuit of leisure uh, activities, boat and so on, and his new friend uh, Lauren Sanchez? How is that just the kind of normal maturity of somebody, or is this uh, a, a change in Jeff? It, it's certainly a change, I, and, and that is one of the reasons why, you know, the, the book took me in unexpected ways. It wasn't just about the growth of a company. It ended up being a transformation of a person, almost in front of our eyes, right? It's visibly apparent, and that, that was partly, you know, focusing a little less on Amazon, buying the Washington Post, battling with the Trump administration so visibly, uh, but also, I think, starting to enjoy some of the uh, advantages of fame and extraordinary wealth. And I wouldn't have said that Jeff Bezos circa 1998 or certainly uh, 2010 would have been a boat guy or a luxury car guy or buying, I can't even summon the number off the top of my head, an extraordinary property in LA, I think the biggest real estate deal in California history. And yet, you know, clearly, um, he has uh, not only stepped onto a larger stage in, ter in terms of the fame and attention and being the richest person in the world, but you know seems to be a little less obsessively focused on tuning the machinery of his business and enjoying uh, the advantages that come with that lifestyle. This has been a terrific uh, interview, Brad. As we wind down here, the way healthcare people look at Amazon and Bezos is a singular commitment to the consumer. And the healthcare organizations uh, look somewhat enviously because they haven't been that good at it. Uh, those of you in the tech world, and you in particular, as you've tracked Bezos and Amazon, was that really an important part of his success, this kind of preoccupation with the consumer? No doubt. You know, and that was, it's easy to be cynical, particularly if, you know, you're a journalist uh, like I am about that because you hear it from a lot of corners. You know, who, who will come out and say they are... Uh, not focused on the customer. It almost feels like a cliche. And then, but then you look at some of the, you know, the uneconomical things Amazon has done over the years, Prime being maybe a great example to say, we're going to figure it out and have sort of faith in our model, but we're going to reduce a customer pain point by delivering in two days. Um, I actually have some examples in the book where I feel like they've maybe gotten away from the customer first principle. Uh, advertising and the search engine being like a great example, they went for kind of the gold mine there uh, instead of uh, giving customers presumably what they would want, which would be the most useful search result. Yeah. I'll just say, Gary, in, in healthcare, Amazon views it as a major avenue of expansion. They've got this secret group called the Grand Challenge. The name kind of says it all inside the company. Bezos himself meets with them a couple of times a month. And they're a fountain of new ideas. And in a very Amazon-like way, none of it really makes sense together. It's a jumble of ideas. They've got clinics, a telehealth service. They've got Alexa glasses and a wristwatch. Um, and the idea is that the next story or chapter 
uh, hopefully not book uh, for my own sanity. And, and the Amazon story is going to be big new markets that create uh, an impact and healthcare is one of them. And I think, you know, they're committed to trying to do something uh, meaningful there. Well, we'll be following that 20% of the gross domestic product. So, you know, they have to be looking at healthcare and we'd love it if you dig into that for an article or a book, uh, because it should be interesting. Brad, thanks so much for spending the time with us. So shortly after you published uh, Amazon Unbound, it's just a terrific book and you're great at what you do. So thanks for being with thanks, us. Thanks, Gary. I really appreciate it. I, 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 uh, I'm appreciative of you having me on the show.